use the inverse function theorem in this problem, we want to find f inverse prime evaluated at 3 for this function f of x is x to the fifth plus x cubed plus 1. And we're given an open interval, which is minus infinity to infinity. And to remind you, this is the statement of the inverse function theorem um, here. And there's some things we need to check before we apply it. So first of all, we have an open interval i. You see it's minus infinity to infinity. We need the function to be differentiable, and we need the derivative to be non-zero on the interval. The derivative is 5x to the fourth plus 3x squared. And this certainly exists everywhere on this whole real line. Now you might be concerned about this part, that the derivative must be not equal to zero. And you see, if we evaluate this at zero, we get zero, okay? You might think this is problematic, but if we want to apply this theorem exactly, what we can do is just restrict to a, a smaller open interval so that we still have three in the image. So let's take the time now to think about this. We're going to need it anyways in our calculation. Okay, so f inverse of 3. Well, if you look at this function, you know, you notice that evaluating at 1 gives you 3. And so this means that f inverse of 3 must be 1. Okay, so now comes the time where we can find an interval containing one that sort of avoids where the derivative is zero if we want to apply this theorem exactly. Okay, so let's take i to be maybe zero to two. It's an open interval. And then you see f prime is not equal to zero on i because this function, you can tell by looking at it, it's always greater than or equal to zero because we have, we have even powers. And the only time it's zero is when x is zero. And that's not in my interval. So in particular, it's strictly positive on i, but we just need non-zero to use this theorem. Okay, now we're ready to use it. And the theorem says that if you want the inverse prime at 3, it will be 1 over f prime of, and now we put in f inverse of 3, right? We calculated this already. It is right here. So we do 1 over f prime of 1 like this, okay? f prime of 1, well, we evaluate. It's 5 plus 3, 8. We get 1 over 8. Let's continue with this example for a moment because it's super cool. So this function, even though the derivative is 0, you know, f prime of 0 is 0, as we discussed, this function is 1 to 1 um, everywhere. It's kind of like x cubed, where, where you have a place where the derivative is zero, but you're still one to one. But you might ask yourself, you know, what happens, you know, at this place, we know the derivative is zero at zero. And so if we think about what's going to happen with the inverse function theorem there, technically we could not apply it, okay? <laughs> so let's look. The inverse function theorem, Okay, there are requirements about the derivative being non-zero, but we have the inverse function prime here is 1 over f prime here, okay? And, and there were requirements that we need. It needs to be differentiable and non-zero on an interval. Well, you see, if I Let's say I want to find, and we can use our above calculation as a strategy. If 
I try to apply F inverse prime at one, okay? And you know, this I had written, but certainly F of zero is one, and, and with our discussion about this being one to one, that means the inverse function at one is zero, okay? So this would say it's one over f prime of f inverse of one, we would get one over zero. Now, I'm gonna put this in quotes. This is problematic, right? This certainly is not something that you wanna see. One of the reasons we need the, re the requirement that the derivative is non-zero, even when the function's one to one. But let me include a graph of this function with its inverse, and you can see really what's happening in the inverse function, you know, at the point one comma zero. 